Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Surah Al-Baqarah, Chapter 2, Verse 3, Part 2. If you remember, we covered Part 1 and first two aspects were covered in Verse 3. Today we are going to cover establishing Salat and keeping Rizq available. These are the references and all extracts in this talk are taken from the meanings of the Quran, Volume 1. And this is our contact in case anyone has got a query or question regarding this presentation or any of our previous presentations or for that matter any other aspect or question regarding Quran or Tulu Islam. Recap of verse 2 3, that is part 1. Four important aspects of the system of Deen are noted in this verse, i.e., Iman, Iman in the unseen, establishment of Salat and making risk available for others. The tense used is collective, i.e. part of the system. In fact, now onwards, we will be dealing with the system of deen, which is collective rather than individual. But we should also look at our own role within the system because individual is important. It is individuals coming together make the system of deen. Two aspects are covered in this presentation, i.e. Iman and Iman in the unseen, that is Ghaib. The Quran has asked those who are looking for guidance to acquire conviction in its message through a process and procedure as explained within its folds. This Iman has five constituents, i.e. that is the concept in Allah, the hereafter, Malaika, the books and the Anbiya. These constituents form the basis of accepting Iman and the Quran describes these at various places and refers to the changes which take place within the human psyche as a result of accepting Iman. This journey of acceptance moves from individual to becoming part of a jamaat e mumineen For Iman in the unseen, it tells us that as we tread on the path of the Quran, the results gradually start to manifest and appear as signs noted in various verses. In fact, the interesting part is that even when people follow destructive path and they think these are in their own interest and for their benefit, the results also turn up, the adverse results turn up later on, but is unseen, that is the destructive consequences of their actions, those become seen if people continue on that path after some time. Since Deen is a collective system, hence the first signs appear in the form of a change within the psyche of Mumineen. An overview of today's presentation, we covered the aspects of Iman and Iman in the Unseen in Part 1. In this presentation, we will share the next two important aspects related to establishing Salat as a system and making risk bestowed by Allah available for mankind. And risk means all means of sustenance. In verse 2 2, it is stated that the Quran provides guidance to muttaqeen, i.e., who wish to remain protected from the dangers and pitfalls of life in the world. Part of this procedure to establish the system of Salat after acquiring Iman, that is the consequence of this acquisition, is so that what is given in the Quran can materialize as a system in the world. This is a system in which Allah's laws are meant to be obeyed willingly and not mechanically. And that's an important aspect that we should not follow these laws or understand even these laws mechanically but willingly. And when established, it creates balance and harmony in the world which cannot be acquired through man-made laws. Part of this system is the equitable distribution of risk and to meet the needs of the development of the human self. And that is an important aspect that these are not just physical means of sustenance but all that which relates to human psyche is also included. Ample resources and means of sustenance are kept on planet Earth for all times for the whole of humanity. These will meet the physical needs of the whole of creation which includes mankind. Hence, if these means of rizq are utilized as per the guidance of the Quran, there will never be any conflict and chaos in the world. Now, we look at the verse itself, Iman and its signs of manifestation. And we had gone through this verse previously as well. I've just quoted it from the previous presentation. Allah zina yuminuna bil wa yukimuna salata wa mimma zaknahum junfikun. 
These are the people who maintain conviction in those realities which are obscured from the sight and trust on those outcomes of the right path which, though they are initially concealed from the sight, it is a certainty that they will ultimately manifest before them. And this is an evidence-based fact. For this purpose, these people establish that system in which all people keep obeying the laws of Allah and whatever means of sustenance they are given, after keeping back what is required for their own needs, they keep the rest available for the nourishment of mankind. Next two aspects of the verse. We covered some aspects of Iman and Iman in the unseen in our previous presentation. Those two aspects are part of acquiring guidance as muttaqeen. And the first step is to acquire precisely that Iman which meets the criteria laid down by the Quran. The reason is that in order to tread on sirat e mustaqim we need to feel the need and have the desire to discard other paths of life and come to the path defined and expounded by Allah in the Quran. So it is important on our part that we should look at all paths, all roads, all directions available in the man-made system and then look at their finer aspects, advantages as well as disadvantages. And then look at the Quran, the path which is put forward by the Quran, and then compare. And then make a decision whether the Quranic path is for us or not. In the next part of the verse is stated, Yukimuna Salata, i.e. to establish Salat, also covered under 1778, not read Salat or Namaz, as it is commonly translated. Why to establish it? Because Yukimuna means something to establish, something which is balanced, something which is visible, evidence-based fact. Because we wish to turn the outcome of our accepting Iman from the unseen to the seen. And for that, some action is required by those who have become a jamaat e mumineen Next is, then the next part invites us to two further aspects related to the means of sustenance and nourishment which are provided on planet Earth for the use of the whole of mankind. It is stated, So we can see that the Salat as a system is linked to the system of sustenance of the Quran. The root of Salat. Now this is the root of Salat and we can look in the Lugatul Quran for further details. It is middle of part of the back, for example in relation to the animal, the slope of the back or that part of an animal where the tail is attached. In a horse race, when the number two horse is running behind the leading horse, it has its head in line with the other's back. The horse in front is called Sabik and the one behind it is called Al Musalli. So this is the same root is being used, that is Sali. From this, Salah means to follow behind closely, walking behind the one in front in such a way that there is no gap between the two but the one falling behind should not overtake the one in front. So the core meaning of this word Salat is to follow, to obey. From this, the meaning in relation to the Quran will be to obey the laws of Allah. The meaning of Salat will be to connect with the commands of Allah. And of course, if we have to learn the commands first, remaining within the limits defined by Allah and remaining in touch with the book of Allah. From this brief summary, the fundamental meaning of Salat becomes clear, i.e. it is to obey the laws of Allah. This will be the meaning, Akim is Salat. And we remember Akim was covered under Surah Al-Fatiha when we said that Salat al-Mustaqim, because Mustaqim has the same root. Everything in the universe carries out its tasks. And over here, I'll just go through the meaning. See you not that it is Allah whose laws are followed in the heavens and the earth and by birds with wings. Each one knows its own Salat. So over here in this verse is used, Akad Alima Salatahu. For further details, see Lugatul Quran. Elaborating this aspect further, it is fundament its fundamental meaning is to walk behind someone because Arabs used to illustrate the meaning of ideological and abstract realities through tangibles. Therefore, among them, in a horse race, the horse in second place, which gallops continuously in such a way that its forelock is touching the tail of the leading horse, would be called al-Basalli, and the horse in front would be called Sabikun. 
It is on this basis that Imam Raghib has said that when it is stated in the Quran in verse 7443 that we were not among the Musalleen, the meaning of this is that we were not among those who followed behind the Anbiya. And Anbiya means the messengers who brought the guidance of Allah. It is noted in the important book of Lugat, Tajul Arus, that among the meanings of this root are attachment, i.e. to remain devoted and attached to someone. From this aspect, Kartbi has written in his tafsir that Salat will mean attachment to the divine system, to remain within the divine limits, to adhere to Allah's book. On this basis, the meanings of Salat are also to carry out the responsibilities defined by Allah. All these meanings are of, of this word are fine, but the issue for us is that we have to convince ourselves that when Quran says Akimus Salat, it means to establish Salat. It is not to just read it and without any results, because then we will become satisfied that this is the purpose, whereas this is not the purpose. Coming together and working for the system of deen is the purpose and focus of the Quran. In relation to Sirat Mustaqim, in Surah Al Fatiha, the supplication of Mu'minin is show us the straight path, and we had gone through it. And in Surah Hud, it is stated that my Rabb is on the straight path. And it's very interesting. If Allah is on the straight path in terms of the system of Rububiyat, then it means that we follow the straight path of Rububiyat. From this, it will appear as if Allah is leading ahead on the straight path and the Mu'mineen are making supplications to follow after Him. It is this very meaning which is intrinsic in Salat. But this kind of allegorical interpretation is against the true concept of Allah. Therefore, its meaning can only be this, that system of the universe which obeying the divine laws is moving forward through its evolutionary stages. This meaning becomes crystal clear in this verse of Surah Nur, in which it is stated, part of this verse I have already quoted, See you not that it is Allah whose tasbi all beings in the heavens and on earth do celebrate. And tasbi means to follow laws of Allah with full vigor, with full force, with full effort. And the birds of the air with wings outspread. Each one knows its own mode of salat and tasbi. And Allah knows well all that they do. And of course, Allah knows everything what humans do as well. And He is even aware of our thought process. The explanation of the word tasbih means to strive fully for the achievement of the objective before you and to expand, expand your full energies in its pursuit. It is stated in this verse that every single thing in the universe knows its own tasbih and salat. This matter is clear that every single thing in the universe also knows what its assigned duties are and what the procedure is for carrying these out for which they have to remain busily striving. The fundamental meaning of Salat becomes evident from this. And human beings also have an aim in front of us and which is to establish this system over here in order to develop ourselves and for the good of whole of mankind. Relating the absence of Salat to human evil deeds. At another place, the Quran has made clear what the meaning of us Salat is in relation to human beings themselves and what its outcome is. What is achieved through its establishment and what destruction ensues through wasting it. In Surah Maryam, initially there is mention of various Ambiya, that is the messengers, and it is stated that these were the people who were blessed with Allah's Nema. And Nema we know means Allah's bounties, blessings, everything related to the means of sustenance. After them, such disobedient people were born into their Ummas who wasted a Salat. The question which arises is, what did they do as a consequence of which as salat became wasted? The Quran states, but after them there followed a posterity who lost as salat and followed after lust. So that means people started following their own unbridled desires and unbridled desires of human beings which are unguided and not guided by the way of Allah will always take them to ruin and destruction, particularly as a collective system. An individual living with a man-made system may get through the system okay, physically at least, but collectively the system always goes into decline. Soon then will they face destruction. So unseen becomes seen if people follow the wrong path, and unseen becomes seen if people follow the right path.
So in both cases, there is an element of ghaib. They began to follow their base desires. From this, it is evident that establishment of Salat and the following of one's own desires are two opposing things. As has already been clarified, the satisfaction of human desires is not a bad thing, provided they are fulfilled by remaining within the limits defined by Allah. And that's an important point. Quran is not asking us to give up our desires. In fact, Quran wants us to have desires, but those desires should be kept within the permanent values of the Quran so that we can get best out of this life. They wreak devastations at that point when they exceed the limits and become rebellious. Note how human deeds, whether good or evil, pass through the state of unseen to seen. Establishment of Salat requires power in the land. Very important point, it is not about just carrying out some kind of rituals and practices and think that we have done the job. A Salat therefore means the satisfaction and fulfillment of human desires and emotions according to the divine laws, to obtain work from them while remaining within the divine limits, to make these follow the divine laws. It is obvious that this objective can only be achieved within a collective system. That system in which different individuals worked towards the goal defined by Allah instead of pursuing their own vested interest. This is the reason why the Quran has declared the establish establishment of Salat to be a collective duty. And not only this, it has also stated that the establishment of Salat is only possible when the Jamaat al-Mu'mineen has acquired power in the land. They have their own independent state. And in Surah Al-Hajj it is stated, they are those who, if we establish them in the land, establish Salat and give Zakat, and join right and forbid wrong, with Allah rest the end and the scene of all affairs. Very interesting and powerful verse and states the fact. And we need to concentrate on, the, on, on verses like that so that we are convinced of the collective system of deen. And over here I've quoted it in Arabic, in makannahum, in makannahum fil arde, that is when they are established in the land and akumus salata, they establish salat. And important part over here is wa'amaru bil marufe wa nahwa nil munkar. Because they promote what is given in the Quran, those values, and then they ask people and stop them from doing wrong. And that is something which is missing in the man-made system because they don't have any external standard. The values keep changing, the laws keep changing, and people follow their own desires. In this system, every matter goes back to the Quran. Every matter is decided according to the directions given in the Book of Allah. Now, next slide is mutual consultation is the hallmark of Salat. It is clear that there can be no need whatsoever for one's own government for the purposes of reading namaz and the giving of the customary zakat, that is 2.5%, which is prevalent under the man-made system. Based on the prevalent practice, these duties can be carried out under any government. And this is a great folly, a great self-deception. And this prevents people from coming to the Quran because they think emotively and feel satisfied that they are doing their job towards Allah and this is the purpose of their existence. Even during colonization, possess the right to read namaz and give zakat and today Muslims also have this right in every country of the world. And we can see that the freedom to practice religion is permitted in every country of the world and it is part of UNO's charter. It is also clear from this that the meaning of establishment of Salat and the execution of Zakat according to the Quran is not that which is prevalent today. These are those duties which can only be carried out in an own independent state. Regarding the Islamic state, it is stated in, in Surah Ashura, those who hearken to their Rabb on his call and establish Salat, which means they go towards the Quran and they think through it who conduct their affairs by mutual consultation. Very important because this mutual consultation is not based on majority decision. It is based on what is in the Quran and they follow it. And we should keep in mind there is no scope for majority decision within the system of deen. Either we are right or we are wrong. It is a very binary choice. 
and this is important and we should understand that because we go for every matter to the Quran and decide within its permanent values. So it becomes important to know the Quran from beginning to the end. Who keep openly available of what we bestow on them for sustenance. Mu'mineen are those who say upon the invitation of Allah that we accept it. They bow down their heads before His commands, i.e. they establish Salat and settle all their matters through mutual consultation. And whatever sustenance is provided to them by Allah, they keep it available for the universal rububiyat of mankind. And that is the meaning of zakat. A salat is that system of government in which all matters are settled through mutual consultation of the jamaat e and whose primary responsibility is the rububiyat of mankind. A salat and economics. Since the Islamic system becomes established for the practical implementation of the laws and values of the Book of Allah, therefore it is stated at another place as to those who hold fast by the Book and establish Salat. How vast the sphere of a Salat is has been made clear by the Quran in connection with the glowing account of the Messenger Shweb. In Surah Hud, it is stated that the Messenger Shweb presented the message of Allah before his people which they opposed as usual, because it goes against their wishes. People who are benefiting from the prevalent system, that is the man-made system, and who are at the top, and they have power, they don't want to change it, because they think they will lose all the privileges which they are, they have. Whereas if they look at it closely, it is for the good of everyone. And since the system is going to change through their hands, if they come to the way of Allah, then how can they suffer in that? They will be part of all the benefits which the system of deen will present them or bring, bring, bring those benefits to them. After an intense argument, the people asked Shweb, tell us what exactly do you want? He replied that I want freedom for Salat in which you people do not interfere. This religious nation thought according to their own understanding that he wishes permission to worship God in his own way. What objection can there be in this? Because in terms of freedom for religion and its practices, it is fine because these are not going to affect their system. However, the situation was different over here. He can carry out his worship in whatever way he wishes, so they agreed to this. But after a very short while, they noted that by Salat, Shweb did not mean what they had thought. So they told Shweb, they said, O Shweb, does your Salat command you that we leave off the worship which our, four, which our fathers practiced? or that we leave off doing what we like with our wealth and possessions. And that hit them hard, that this Salat of Shweb was going to change their economic system and it will change it into more equitable distribution of wealth. Next slide, some verses on the purpose of Salat. One function of the system of Salat is Atlo ma uhiya elaika min al kitabi wa kimis salata in the salata tanha anil fashai wal munkar. Recite what is sent of the book by Wahi to you, establish salat, and what will happen through the salat, for salat restrains from shameful and unjust deeds. See how cause and effect is established. And it is very important, and we have seen that Quran has clearly said that once they get power in the land, their job is to promote good forbid from evil. The system of Salat will follow individual acts of sharing wealth with those who are left deprived and poor in society. For example, Quran has said in this verse, and we have gone through this verse previously as well, وَاتَ الْمَالَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ زَوِلْ قُرْبَ وَالْجَتَامَ وَالْمَسَكِينَ وَابْنَ السَّبِيلِ وَالسَّائِلِينَ وَفِي الرَّقَابِ وَآكَمَ السَّلَاةَ To spend of your wealth despite love for it for your kin, for orphans, for the needy, for those who ask, and for the release of those who are enslaved, and as a result then establish the system of Salat. Good deeds replace the effects of wrong acts, and this should be part of the system of Salat. Waqim is Salata tarafil nahare bazulfan min al-layle in al-hasanate yuzhibna sayyayat and establish Salat at the two ends of the day and at the approaches of the night for those things that are good, remove those that are evil. So over here we should not get stuck with these timings because elsewhere Quran says that it has to be done on a 
wholesome basis, that is 24-7, because once the system is established, then everyone participates in that, and of course there will be subclasses worked out under these permanent values. Few more verses. Another verse brings an Iman in Allah and in the hereafter as part of the system to be established. And we can look at this verse of Surah Toba, the mosque that is Masajid of Allah shall be visited and maintained as part of the system of deen by those who have Iman in Allah and the hereafter and then establish Salat. So these Masajid, these mosques which we see around, these are going to be the offices and, and the places from where the whole system will be administered. These could be the local uh, gathering places for meeting and solving human problems. Following on from the above, in verse, the next verse after this, do you make the giving of drink to pilgrims or the maintenance of the Masjid al-Haram equal to those who have Iman in Allah and the last day and strive with might and main in the cause of Allah? Very important verse. The more we concentrate on this, the more we will get out of it and we will see that these all ritualized practices, how much harm these are doing to on the path of the system of deen. Because it is all related to human psyche. If we become satisfied with these ritualized practices, then we are not going to work for the system of deen. Human beings only work for some system once they become dissatisfied, fully unhappy with the present state of affairs. They are not equal in the sight of Allah and Allah guides not those who are unjust or zalimin. And this is very powerful part of uh, this verse at the end. Wallahu la yahdil qawmiz zalimin. And Quran is pointing to this all injustices which take place and because people are lost in these ritualized practices, they do not pay attention towards the system of deen. And they do not see all these poor in the world who are looking for justice in the world and since there is no jamaat e mumineen hence they can never get help from Allah. An example of this gathering is in verse 62.9 and we remember this is in relation to the Salat of Juma. O oh, those who have accepted Iman when the call for Salat on the day of congregation is announced hasten earnestly to the Zikr of Allah. And Zikr of Allah means to go towards his laws. We have to come together and discuss. So all meetings and congregations under this system of Salat are for a purpose. And the purpose is to figure out what is given in the Quran in relation to the system of Deen. And leave off business that is best for you if you but knew. The whole of the Quran is Zikr of Allah for Mumineen. Now let us go to the last part of the verse 3, continuing to the next precept, which is Mimma Razakna Hum Junfikun. This is stated to be the next characteristic of the Muttaqeen. These words are translated as whatever sustenance we have bestowed on them, they spend out of it. It is obvious that every individual spends his wealth and riches. Hence, what is that characteristic in this of the Muttaqeen? due to which the need arose to say about them that muttaqi are those who spend their wealth and riches. And a very important point noted over here, that if everyone, lot of people do charity across the world, and still poverty increases, hunger increases, injustice increases across the world. And Quran over here is pointing to something different, and that is being discussed here. For this, the most that needed to have been said was that they spend their wealth and money with care and desist from extravagance. The command for this has been given at other places. Because the individual acts of charity are at the initial transitional stage of turning the man-made systems into the system of deen. But ultimately as a system will cater for everything and that will be covered under Bamimma Razaknahum Junfikun. Thus, the characteristic of the muttaqeen which has been described is not just that they refrain from extravagance. This attribute is far higher and unique than this. And elaborating risk in Vamimmar Zaknahum Junfikun. In this respect, let us first of all consider the word, word risk. And the root is given here. Everything on which life depends and which is declared to be the cause for its nourishment is called risk. 
From this perspective, you can call rizq as the means of nourishment. Since from the Quranic perspective, human life is not just confined to his physical body. Other than this, there is the human self as well, whose development is absolutely necessary. Therefore, According to the Quran, all those resources will be included in risk which are essential for the nourishment of the human body and for the development of his self, which is the fount of human potentials. And that is very important because we have seen that how means of sustenance affect human psyche. We can't go to a hungry person, a poor person, deprived person and start giving them lectures about the system of deen. They will look at us and say that, where is your system first? Cater for our needs first. Because everything which we do physically, it is also manifestation of our thinking and both are intricately linked with each other. So we should keep that in mind that what is applicable to human body is also applicable to human psyche because thought, thoughts are affected by that. In relation to risk for the development of the human self, it is stated in Surah Al-Hajj, and those who leave their homes in the cause of Allah and are then slain or die. And see, when they leave their homes, it is their thought process because they want to go to a land where the system of deen is being established. And that strong desire within their own psyche is the one which is going to develop their self. On them, Allah will bestow a goodly provision. Truly, Allah is He who is the best of providers. And we can see over here, what I've done over here is highlighted the important aspect, which is related to risk. And then Quran says, Allah is the best of razikeen. So once we come under the system of deen, then we will see that how the system of deen caters for the needs of body as well as of the human self. And if the self is developed, then of course it becomes eligible for more risk in the life of the hereafter. Allah will bestow risk a hasna, that is the balanced one, in which human, no human being is humiliated, no human being is disrespected, human beings don't lose their dignity. Risk comes to them from all directions. On those people who for the sake of the fulfillment of the program of Allah, give up their homes and possessions if the need arises, that is they emigrate and then are killed confronting the enemy en route or otherwise meet their death due to some incident. Now explaining Yun Fikun, the route is given here. After the death of a human being, food and nutriment is no longer required for the nourishment of the body. Therefore, by risk -e hasna is meant those means of risk due to which the human self develops. The aim of stating this is that, according to the Quran, all those means of nourishment through which the growth of the body and development of his human potentials can be achieved will be included in risk. Among the Arabs, one characteristic of risk was also that it should be made available on time, i.e. whatever kind of nourishment is needed at any particular time, it should be readily available. So they, it should be enough and it should be provided at the right time when it is required. So this is the responsibility of the system of deen. If they want to follow, follow Allah. Now we come to the word Yunfikun, the root of which is Naf Moon is that tunnel whose points of entry and exit are both open. Other than the passage to enter it, the hole that is made by a wild mouse has many passages constructed by it on the other side by which to leave. And it covers these with fine soil so that if someone tries to capture it, then it can escape through these roots. A sort of a tunnel. This type of tunnel is called nafq. By the same token, as munafik or hypocrite is that individual who before entering some system plans in his heart that in case I have to exit this, then which roots will need to be taken. The basic meaning of this route is not that of spending, but is that of keeping open. A very important point we should keep in mind, all these translations are misrepresentation of the Quran. This word is used as the opposite of holding back, as is clear from the following verse. Say, if you had possessed the treasures of the mercy of my Rabb, behold, you would keep them back for fear of spending them. And the word used is al-infaq, for man is ever miserly. Another side of this term, that is Yunfikun, 
when there were no currency notes and wealth used to be in the form of gold and silver coins, then coins used to be kept in certain sacks whose mouths used to be open, but the other side used to be closed. This technique of keeping wealth is also an antonym of infaq. Thus it is stated in Surah Al-Maraj that hell will cry out to that individual who holds wealth and then keeps the mouth of the sack tightly closed. And the words used are wajama fa'awa. Fa'awa means he keeps it closed at the top so that nobody can take it away. Similarly, in Surah Toba, the word infaq has appeared in opposition to iktanaz, where it is stated that those people who hold back coins of gold and silver and do not keep open the lids of their money chests give them the glad tiding and it is very interestingly noted over there that give them glad tiding of a severe chastisement because they were holding back which belonged to others in the society i.e of such a punishment which these coins will be heated in hell and with them their foreheads sides and backs will be imprinted and we can see the state of the world around us and this is because of this concentration of wealth in few hands at the top and nothing is being done about it and more and more wealth is going to the top and more and more and the poverty is increasing with every passing time across the globe. And they will be told that this is that wealth which you had piled up and held back for yourself alone and you did not desire to keep it available to be used for Allah's program. And it's a very big task, very challenging task and what we need to do is to understand it through and through and relate it to what is happening in the outer world. Not to be scared of it, not to be feeling guilty about it, rather than at this stage thinking about it and going through and make it part of our consciousness. In Surah Muhammad it is stated that if you adopt this path, then remember that you will become destroyed and your place will be taken by some other nation who will not be like you. And we can see that all these Muslim countries are under the subjugation of others who are more powerful. And despite having the Quran, they simply do not understand. And biggest disparity and enslavement exists in these countries. Intellectually, they are extremely backward. It is evident that in fact does not mean to spend, but is the term for such a course of action, ideology or economic system in which the means of sustenance are not kept held back, but are held open for the universal rububiyat of mankind. Risk is the responsibility of Allah. The Quran has stated, there is no moving creature on earth, but its sustenance depends on Allah. There is no living entity on the face of the earth for whose risk Allah has not taken the responsibility upon himself. From this, an important question arises in our mind that our observation is this, on which human history is also a witness, that human beings continually die of hunger. The question which comes to mind is that when Allah has taken the responsibility upon himself for the risk for every moving living thing on earth, then what kind of responsibility is this in which half of the population goes to sleep hungry at night? This question is extremely important and it is essential to understand the true reality for this. And we do hear from people that if there is God, why why he is allowing so much cruelty and tyranny in the world. Allah created man as well as his other creation and together with this, in fact, even before their creation, created all those means of sustenance on which their life was dependent. For example, air, water, light, heat. All these are present externally on earth and within the earth stores the food which have to be extracted after only a little effort. Allah fulfilled his responsibility in this way. It is from this aspect that he has called himself Razak and Razak, the one who provides sustenance. Next slide is, the real question is that of distribution of risk. And that is an important point for us. If Allah had to make everything himself and distribute it, then we, he wouldn't have given us choice and intent. We would have been just animals roaming around on this planet Earth. Whereas we have a very high responsibility and the rewards are also immense because as a consequence we get a life which goes forever and ever. That is an eternal life and of course with a developed self we enjoy the life and the pleasures of this life and this living in this world. 
After this, the question arises before us about the distribution of risk. People with a superficial understanding said that this distribution should also have been retained in his own hand by Allah so that he could have continued to provide risk directly to every needy person. In reply to this, Allah stated that this view is wrong. We have created man as possessor of freedom to choose and intent. Therefore, the system of distribution of risk has been given into his hands and we do not interfere in this. And we can see that, that Allah does not interfere into it. It is left to the emergence of jamaat e mumineen those who follow the book of Allah and then establish the system. We have provided clear instructions about this system of distribution. The guidance of infaq is at the top of this list. We can see it is right at the beginning of the Quran, which means that no individual should withhold risk which is beyond his own need. And who can take away that risk and then redistribute it? It is the duty of mumineen. You should keep it available to fulfill the needs of others. The basis of this ideology is on this reality that the means of sustenance, whether it is within the earth or above it, cannot be the private property of one man or a group of men. Because Quran has declared our life to be mataul hayat dunya, that we are journeying through this life and we should not accumulate it because on a journey we don't take a lot with us. We want to travel light. And of course, we will travel light if our self is not burdened with the injustices and tyranny of others and, and what is going on in the world. Its right of ownership belongs only to Allah who has created it for the universal sustenance of all of his creation. The unjust distribution of risk is based on this wrong and evil ideology that man can have a right to ownership over the means of production. This ideology is the basis and foundation of the capitalist system and is the root cause of all destructions and devastations. Promoting inequitable distribution of risk is kufr. The group holding the reins of power, whether it is in the shape of dictatorships of ancient times or in the mold of present day democracy, because end of the day, it is the man-made system. People who somehow rise to the top because the system allows them to come to the top and they use all kind of machinations to come to the top. And once they are in power, we can see that unbridled human intellect and desires have nothing in terms of guidance from Allah. So if they don't have, they don't follow the guidance of Allah, how are they going to work on behalf of Allah? takes the means of production into its own possession and then by making other human beings dependent on them for their basic food, makes them obey their every command. When the hungry populace raises its voice in protest against this, then the religious clergy quietens them into a slumber by saying that Allah has kept the distribution of risk in his own hand. And nowadays, in the, particularly in the Western world, this aspect of religious clergy is taken over by media and it's very effective. Whomsoever he wishes, he makes rich. Whomsoever he wishes, he keeps poor. On whomsoever he wishes, he bestows abundant risk. Whomsoever he wishes, he keeps hungry. And this is how the Quran is translated. And when somebody reads the Quran like that, then they can't volunteer themselves to do anything because they think it is Allah who is doing everything. No human being can remove this differentiation because it is created by Allah. If Allah had wished that you do not remain hungry, then why would he not have provided bread to you himself? And while these people who are in power, and even if they read the Quran, and why don't they think that why did Allah give them more than others? Because it satisfies their greed. And once it satisfies their greed, they don't have any, any feeling of guilt. They leave it, everything to Allah, just like Iblis and Shaitan accused Allah for injustice. The Quran has declared this reasoning to be not only batil but kufr. It is noted in Surah Yasin that and when they are told spend of the bounties with which Allah has provided you and over here we should say that keep that open which Allah has provided to you. The unbelievers that is kafirin say to those who have iman shall we then feed those whom if Allah had so willed he would have fed himself. You are in nothing but manifest error. Why the kila lahum anfiku? See the same word in Faq is noted over here. Wa mimma raza kumullahu kal lazina kafaru lil lazina amanu. So those who are doing kufr, they tell mu'minin 
that if Allah wished, he should have given it himself. Man lau yashaw lahu atamahu. Rational for relating rizq to Allah. The true foundation of the Quranic economic system is inherent in the word na, in razak nahum, that is Allah gives it. Because this is how we have to relate it, because everything is coming from Allah. The intellect which is given to us and this intellect which is displaying and manifesting kufr is also from Allah. And we got it free and then we utilized it for wrong purpose. Allah stated that the risk which we have given you, i.e. risk is owned by Allah. He has made it available free without any return and payment. You can look at the Quran from the beginning to the end. You will find words like razaknahum, razakakum regarding risk, i.e. risk is provided from the direction of Allah. The question is only regarding its distribution. And land is the basic means of risk. Regarding this, he has repeatedly stated that this is in the ownership of Allah. And this is what the system of deen will do. It will return the land within that uh, government, within that rule of, of the Quran back to Allah. Nobody will own anything because why should one own if this is a journey of life? And that is something which with which we have to change our own psyche. This is something we have to think very hard, very profoundly through and through. Earth is Allah's land. In it is the means of sustenance for men and their animals. It's worth looking through these verses. There is the means of sustenance for the whole of mankind. It has been created solely for the benefit of creation. It should be kept available equally for all those who need it. This reality has been stated with great brevity, but in an extremely attractive style in Surah Al-Hadid. And what cause have you, why you should not spend in the cause of Allah? I put it in inverted commas because over here is that why don't you keep it open in the cause of Allah? Make it freely available. If we don't think about it, then it is not going to happen. The first stage is that we should start thinking like that. For to Allah belongs the heritage of the heavens and the earth. Risk belongs to Allah. What does this mean? When the truth is that whatever is in the highs and lows of the heavens and the earth all belongs to Allah, then who are you to withhold those resources of sustenance and to not keep them available for the benefit of the children of Adam? In order to obtain risk from the land, you certainly make some effort. The maximum you can have is the right for a return for this effort of yours, not for the whole produce. Very important aspect that the land belongs to Allah. We till it, we get crops out of it, we put an effort. Land was free, our intellect was free, sunshine was free, air was free, and water, we can charge for that because if we pay for it like irrigation water. And our efforts for that, we should get it. And what belongs to Allah in terms of our intellect, free sunshine, free land, then it should be redistributed among those who do not have the privilege of having their, their sustenance met by the system. And this is for the initial stages of the establishment of the system of deen. At this stage, we should keep in mind that we have to change our psyche. Take the reward due for your work and give the remainder to the owner that is Allah of the land. He has described this fact in a very eloquent way in verses 56, 63 to 73. Worth going through these verses of Surah Al-Waqiyah. The following is the meaning of these verses taken from the exposition of the Quran that is Mufum Al-Quran. Don't look at the translations. They are very poorly translated verses. We have to look at these, for example, by listening to the lectures of Alama Parvez and also look at the book of sustenance which is now translated into english for this purpose just study this system a little according to which your nourishment and growth takes place and then think does all this take place according to allah's law or according to your own device laws for example just examine the farming in which you engage how much is your contribution in it and what sorts of things does our law do by plowing the land, you sow seed in it. Now tell us who grows a crop out of this seed. So who has kept the potential of a tree, of a crop in that seed? 
we didn't do it. It is Allah who has done it. And this is where we have to pause, pause for a few days and reflect on it continuously so that it sinks into our heart and mind what it means in terms of the system of deen. Is it you who does this or does this take place according to our law? Continuing, rizq belongs to Allah. After stating these facts, the Quran states, ponder on this whole machinery of the universe of the production of risk and then reflect whose law is working here. Then also reflect to what extent is your share in all this program and to what extent that of the divine system. And this is where one becomes companion of Allah because something he has provided, something we have to contribute to it. In whatever way you look at it, you will ultimately come to this conclusion that your contribution is only your effort in this business. All the rest is carried out by the divine system. Hence, in its production, that is mean of sustenance, your share can only be proportional to your input of work. And that is what justice demands. And thinking like that is part of becoming mu'min. It is not just, we have gone through Iman and we know that what it means. It is a process, it's the procedure in which we have to go to the extremities of our thinking and letting the things sink into our mind that what exactly Allah is asking us to do and do we have the potentials to understand it, which we have. You cannot become owner of the whole. All these means of production exist in their own right. They are neither made by you nor purchased by you. They remind you of this fact that Allah has made them the means of sustenance of life for the needy. And that is very important that if there are needy in the world, that means the system is unjust. It is a tyrannical system. It is enslavement of other human beings. This means that in this business, the effort is yours and the means of production ours. Hence, retain the reward of your hard work in this for yourself in the form of means of nourishment and pass on our share to us. And this is what Allah is saying that you talk about the rights of Allah. And here is the right of Allah that whatever is excess of your own needs, one, what you have not put in effort for belongs to Allah. And it is for your own good because if you take out the chaos and conflicts within your society, then you will live a far happier life, free from fear and huzan. And then see your, how your latent potentials develop in that society. The question which arises is, who are unable to provide the means of nourishment for themselves? Once it reaches them, consider it to have reached us. This fact has also been noted in these verses. Now, the position of Mu'mineen in this regard. In this matter, Mu'mineen adopt a different path with Allah. It is their Iman that not only the land, the means of production, but their own potentials to produce risk are also fundamentally bestowed by Allah. The Quran declares, and you have no good thing that is Nema, but is from Allah. We are provided with these Nema so that we can employ these according to the defined program of Allah. This is why we will be accountable for these. Then shall you be questioned that day about these good things. In fact, we are already being held accountable for this. The mess we have created on Allah's planet Earth is because of this, that we are not following his laws and we have our own desires as our God. This deal of theirs with Allah becomes settled through a mutual covenant. And we have gone through this verse previously as well. Allah has purchased of the Mu'mineen their selves and their possessions for theirs in return is Jannat. And the first stage is to understand it and then willingly make a decision that I will work for this system of thee. They sell their life and possessions into the hands of Allah and in return Allah bestows Jannat on them. Human life and all its potentials are included in life which have been bestowed from the direction of Allah, free from any recompense and payment and in possessions, all that becomes included which man earns himself through his own endeavors. We should not start thinking of the end result that there are going to be a lot of opposition and a lot of um, maybe hardships in it. The Quran says that you start working on this system together and keep making progress, try to understand, bring change within your own psyche. Once the cha change comes within your own psyche, you will see that the things will start 
working in your favor. The signs itself will tell that the change is taking place within your own self and you'll be able to find out all the wrongs which the man-made system is doing. All, all Jannat, as far as the physical life of man is concerned, its characteristic has been described as and eat of the bountiful things therein as, where and when you will. Whenever and wherever hunger is felt, there should be enough available to eat your fill. In this Al Jannat, every member of society will at the very least be at peace from the issue of these basic needs of life. And this has been placed within our reach. The only thing is that we somehow become fearful and we want somebody else to do it. And if everyone thinks like that, then who is going to do it? Somebody has to do it. And there is no point in going through the Quran repeatedly and then going over these verses and keep discussing this word means that and that word means this. And, and then at the end, there is zero outcome by not coming together and putting an effort together. What it means to enter into a covenant with Allah. It also becomes clear that in this society, this mutual covenant between Allah and the Mu'mineen will not be merely ideological and confined to beliefs. It will be practical as such. In religion, by the recitation of a few words, it is assumed that any responsibility has been discharged. But in deen, whatever is uttered or is accepted has to be carried out in practical terms as well. It is religion in which at the front of a house is written, in truth, everything belongs to Allah. That which is given to me is for a few days only. And we see these kind of words written, Hazam in fazl rabbi that which is given to me is for a few days only. And in practical terms, the right of total ownership is protected in his own name and in the name of his progeny. And the real owner is not even allowed to peep into this because people don't think like that. And this is a problem with human psyche. Those of us who have come to this path and wish to work for the system of Deen, the, we should only observe these things and move forward, not to remain bogged down into it. If people don't want to follow this path, it is their choice. But in Deen, the matter of buying and selling, which is mentioned above, is settled in practical terms. A Mu'min sells his life and possessions into the hands of the head of the system, which is shaped in order to carry out the responsibilities of Allah. It is sold into his hands and Allah verifies it that we have purchased it. This is what is called Bayt, the matter of bartering. It is stated in Surah Al-Fatah, Verily, those who plight their fealty to you do no less than plight their fealty to Allah. The hand of Allah is over their hands. And this statement of noted in the Quran needs a profound reflection over many days. It's not an ordinary statement. We have to come to terms with that, that what exactly we want from the Quran. Now, next slide is, let us do some basic calculations. This verse needs some further illustration. Let us go through an extract from what is Islam. The earning of a man is the collective outcome of the following factors. Intellectual ability which every child gets at birth. We all get our intellectual ability free from our parents or physically it doesn't make any difference, but we have intellect and we have emotions right at birth. Initial environment, education, and effects of upbringing, we get it wherever we are born. Opportunities for the use of abilities and skills, again, it is related to what kind of parents we have, what means they have, and what kind of a society or a nation or a country in which we are born. The personal hard work of a man, and that is where we have to concentrate that what man is going to do within the constraints of the society in which he or she is born. The first of these factors, i.e. intellectual ability, which is of basic importance in this regard, is bestowed free as a gift by nature at birth. It has neither been bought nor can it be bought by an individual. The second and third factors are related to the society within which the child is brought up. Over this also, he has no personal control. For example, if somebody is born in a poor family in the slums, there is no opportunity for him or her. But if somebody is born in a, in a royal family, he or she has all opportunities which are available within the man-made system. And it is evidence-based. We can see 
this being displayed everywhere in the world. Over this also, he has no personal control. Only the fourth factor, i.e. the personal hard work of an individual, is such a thing which the person utilizes by employing his intent and choice. From this brief analysis, it is clear that whatever an individual earns, his right can only be over that portion which is the result of his personal effort. This is that fact towards which the Quran has drawn our attention by stating, An laisal il insani illa masa, man should get what he works for. That is the effort he is putting in. And that is a permanent value of the Quran. And we have to look into it as a permanent value. And we can see over here that how it is, how important it is to understand this issue right at a fundamental level. Now, further reflection on this uh, previous slide. Let us put a figure on each of the previous four points. Intellectual ability which every child gets at birth is 100% from Allah. Any disability here will not be of much use even if the next three opportunities are present. And we should concentrate on that, that intellect is coming from Allah and it is 100% ability. It is not of our own choice. We did not make any effort for that. For example, all this presentation which we are sharing is based on that intellect which was given from Allah 100%. Next point is initial environment, education and effects of upbringing dependent on choice and man-made system where a child is born and it is a birth lottery. I call it birth lottery because if, for example, we, those of us who are in the West, if we do not have this environment, we wouldn't have been able to even we wouldn't have even known about Zoom. We would be sitting somewhere in a slum and counting our days. Opportunities for the use of the ability and skills, man-made system. Again, it is a lottery available selectively. And the last one is the, the personal hard work of a man is 100% possible. However, a laborer can work very hard and still will not earn enough. And we know about it that in the third world environment, laborers work from morning till evening and they, uh, what wages they get is decided by the rich man. And these are market wages. It has nothing to do, setting of those wages has nothing to do whether the needs of the family of that laborer are met or not, whether his children are going to be hungry or not, whether his children have education or not. The rich man has nothing to do with that. Dependent on where in the man-made system he is putting in his best. Under the man-made system, more opportunities exist for the clever, and I put it under inverted commas, lot to make far more than an ordinary man who is not so clever. For example, the system is so prone to gambling that people who, for example, bet in stocks or who have an inner information can become millionaires overnight. What is the verdict of the Quran here? Someone with good intellect plus good parenting plus being able to use their ability and acquire skills plus hard work and dedication should take the share of Allah and hand over to those who need it. If we allocate 25% to each factor, for example, if we add 25% for the 100% intellect which Allah has given, given a particular person, then initial environment, for example, being born in a rich family or a rich environment or a rich country, let's say another 25%. Opportunities for the use of the ability and skills, for example, highly educated parents and they will guide them, which is not available to the child of a poor family. And then 25% for this. So this is how I have just roughly calculated it. It, it is just to make a point. The issue if we allocate 25% to each factor, then it comes to 75% because the first one, two, three belong to Allah. The fourth one belongs to man himself. The issue becomes even more serious when we do not wish to even think about this anomaly and imbalance in the world. What is the fault of millions of children across the world who have 100% good intellect but are unable to use their intellectual and physical skills and potentials? And that is very hard hitting. We should think about this, what is covered in this slide for a few weeks. In fact, this should become part of our consciousness for the rest of our life so that we exactly know that what is wrong with the world in which we are living and why do we need the system of deen. Now over here, what I've done is just to illustrate this point, 
few photos should we ask them to release 75% share of Allah and we know this man he is one of the richest and he is another one they have got all the oil in the world a big source of oil which is given by Allah and they should only keep what they have put in effort in terms of its taking it out and then refining it and then distribution it the original source is purely 100% Allah and here is another man and here is another one and there are two of them one is dead one is still alive and there is another one from Kuwait and there is another one very rich another one very rich and there is another one who is exploiting the hard work of others and then these are human beings who also have 100% intellect from Allah but living in slums and these are also human beings across the world and these are also three children human beings with 100% intellect and we can we know the world in which we are living now finally to reiterate the salient points those who are looking for guidance in this finite life which ends with physical death need to note that the guidance of Allah is made available for them so that they can avoid the dangers and pitfalls created by man-made systems in the world. What do they need to do? Create the desire in the form of a supplication asking for guidance onto the straight path of life which is also balanced and well established in terms of its outcomes. The beauty of the Quran is that Allah himself has taught us supplications as well. That if you follow these supplications or you, you say these supplications and then follow the procedure given in that, then just see how things will fall in place, how the system of deen will start manifesting itself right in front of your eyes. Of course, the first stage will be that your psyche will change. Having created this desire and need, this book is provided from the direction of Allah who is Alim. Hakim, Rahman and Rahim as a guide to work collectively for the system which it proposes and also provides complete guidance. And we know Alim means omniscient, Hakim means very wise, all wisdom belongs to him. Rahman and Rahim are related to the system of nourishment and development. This book recognizes the presence of all latent potentials within man as a creation of Allah. Hence, it helps remove all kinds of doubts arising in the human mind and heart. And last point, strive to accept Iman in its value system and as a consequence of this, progress towards the establishment of the system of Salat, which encompasses the distribution of the means of sustenance bestowed by Allah for the use of the whole of humanity. Thanks for your time and for sharing this today. Please feel free to share it with your contacts. You may like to subscribe for future talks related to the Quranic system of Deen.